Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar series, New Tools of the Trade in Life Sciences, Technologies that Enable Breakthroughs. Today's webinar title is Label Retention Expansion Microscopy with Aiden Denoising. My name is Cindy Cook. I'm the project lead for the BioProtocol webinar series. For those of you who are not familiar with BioProtocol, BioProtocol is an open access online journal whose mission is to make science and research more transparent and reproducible. So thank you all for being here and for sharing this vision with us. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our moderator of today's session, to Professor Zhao Yu Shi. Professor Shi is an assistant professor in the Department of Developmental and Cell Biology and the Department of Chemistry at the University of California in Irvine. Her research group uses optical and chemical approaches to develop super resolution microscopy and spatial multiomics methods. She uses cutting edge, edge technologies to study the molecular and cellular mechanisms of aging and cancer. Prior to UC Irvine, she received training in super-resolution microscopy and nonlinear optics during her postdoctoral research at UCSF and her PhD at UC Davis. Professor Shi is a recipient of the NIH Director's New Innovator Award, the NIH Pathway to Independence Award, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Frontiers of Imaging Award, and the Hellman Fellowship. So you thank you so much for being here, and I'm handing it over to you now. Thank you, Cindy, for the great introduction. And now it's my turn. Good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. I'm very excited to moderate uh, the bioproducal webinar for my colleagues and the collaborators, Dr. Xiang Zhao and Dr. M. Chen. Uh, Xiang received his bachelor's and master's degrees at uh, Wuhan University uh, in China, and then he moved to Finland for his PhD research at the University of Helsinki. Uh, there he worked on the role of uh, amphotarian uh, in abronic brain development with doctors Heike uh, Ravella and Perti uh, Panula. After that, he came to the, US, uh, to the US for his postdoc research. That's where uh, I met Xiao, um, that is at UCSF. Um, so there he worked with Dr. Soup Wool on asymmetric cell division. Um, since Xiang is always very acute to any new imaging technologies for animal models, he dared to be the first user of the label retention expansion microscopy when I was uh, still finishing the method development. Um, he used this method to visualize the polarized uh, endosome dynamics during asymmetric cell division in the zebrafish brain, um, live and fixed, and published the work in, uh, in Science Advances in 2021. He took this method, as well as many other imaging and neuroscience tools with him to his current career stage at Biohub. Um, his new research concentrates on cell linear age reconstruction and cell profiling in early development at uh, uh, superspatial and temporal resolution. At Biohub, uh, Xiang met uh, another talented uh, software engineer, M. Chen, who shares the same passion with him for making super resolution and low noise about images. Um, in M. Chen's uh, LinkedIn page, I saw very passionate uh, recommendations for his um, skill set and his passion in science. And one person uh, commented as, uh, M. Chen is the type of person who know how, and if you uh, let him know the question you have, he uh, he will turn it to a code working beautifully in the next day. So I think uh, it's uh, Xiang's luck and my luck to know M. Chen. And Xiang, of course, was fascinated by the powerful denoise algorithm uh, item that M. Chen just developed back then. Without hesitation, uh, Xiang applied uh, item to his zebrafish uh, label retention expansion microscopy images and became a loyal user since then. Um, good methods speak for themselves. Without further ado, let's welcome Xiang and M. Chen to share their integrated method label retention expansion microscopy with ID denoising. Xiang, take it over. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will share the slides now. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Cindy and uh, Xiaoyu, for the great introduction. And hello, everyone. Thank you for taking part in the webinar. And uh, I'm Chen, let me 
We are very pleasant to have the chance to give a talk about uh, uh, label retention expansion microscopy and the iodine. And the, as part of the uh, Bob Protocol webinar series on um, this new tool of the trading life science technology that enables breakthroughs, we are going to introduce how we have applied the label retention expansion microscopy with zebrafish cross section samples and uh, use it for, the, uh, for imaging the radio glass at super resolution. And we are going to explain why we have incorporated uh, iodine uh, denoting with the liberal retention expansion microscopy imaging process. So actually the, the main outlines of uh, our talk would be uh, like the first we are going to introduce uh, expansion microscopy and how label uh, retention expansion microscopy is different from it. And then secondly, I would show how we have visualized the endosome trans transportation of those pass three polarity proteins together with the delta D endosomes in the dividing radio glial cells. And then in the end, uh, Amchen would introduce how to use uh, iodine denoising for most type of bio imaging uh, uh, data and, uh, and uh, how you can choose the right one to fit your aim, yeah. So the first uh, slides here, I would like to show you uh, uh, that's the most uh, commonly used uh, light microscopes in the labs nowadays. And actually mostly we are depending on those uh, white field confocal turf or light shade microscopy. And we are using it for imaging the uh, fluorescent labeled samples or, or that's the immune stained uh, bio samples to observe the intracellular and the cell organelle structures or even the gene expressions at higher resolution. But uh, for most uh, light microscope, the uh, standard fluorescence systems such as the confocal microscope and the light sheet microscope, the lateral resolution is, uh, is always limited to around 200 to, to 250 nanometers at best. Because, uh, because of the light wavelengths, it's not because microscope itself, because, uh, because all the Minimum resolution is only around 200, uh, 0 0.2 micro, micron is, is dictated by the light diffraction limits. So in order to get a higher resolution, uh, if we don't change the <laughs> physical of the light, uh, we need to change the microscopes and then it's more difficult. And uh, for sure there will be stat or same storm which, which are more advanced to get the scale in, into lower than 50 or even 20 nanometer. But, uh, but comparing to, to the upgrade of the microscope, uh, nowadays a lot of groups we are, uh, we are using expansion microscope, uh, which could change the physical confinement, uh, which could change the physical confinement of the samples to achieve the super resolution imaging. And as described in Boyden's paper published in 2015, the polyelectro hydrogels has been used to uh, infuse the fixed and the, and the permeable uh, lysable uh, brain tissues. And uh, actually that gel is, uh, is the gel with sodium, sodium acrylase monomer used to produce super absorbent materials and together with the uh, co-monomer acrylamide and the, the cross-linkers. And then by adding this kind of uh, APS or the, and the T T M E D accelerator to trigger this free uh, radical polymerizations, and uh, and then the gel would form and uh, and get integrated in, uh, with the sample together. And actually, these chemicals are very easy to to be uh, approached because it's commonly used for the SDS page in, in most labs as well. So if you are running Western blot, you should not be that uh, uh, indifferent to that. And uh, also after the tissue polymer com uh, composite has formed, and uh, then we treat it with uh, protease to homo uh, homogenize the uh, mechanical character, uh, characteristics. So just to digest the, all the proteins and, uh, and those kind of things, uh, uh, which are like uh, cell skeletons or the fibers in the cell. After proteolysis and the uh, uh, dialysis, the gel in the water would result in the four to five kind of times uh, linear expansion uh, on each direction, evenly, and uh, it will not distort any gross anatomic. And where you can see the brain slice is expanded quite well. 
And even more, we could see that expanded specimens would be almost transparent because we just add the water to make it expand, uh, to make the expansion. And uh, right now the sample would consist largely of the water. So it's much, much better for the immunofluorescence staining afterwards. And the very, very, uh, and very interesting and, the, and the, the, the best thing here is that they have developed this tri-function linker for the immunofluorescence labeling of the, expanding, uh, of the expanded samples. And the Boyden's group has designed a custom, the fluorescent label that can be incorporated directly into the polymer network and remain at the binding location even after the proteolytic digestions because they have the anchor group here. And, the, and the, then the, uh, the binded uh, uh, trifunction linkers will be remained after digestion of all those kinds of uh, proteins. So uh, it, uh, it uh, helped us to to conquer the restriction of the normal light, uh, uh, normal light microscopes resolution limits. So, and nowadays uh, there are many groups that are developing the, the protocol for applying this expansion microscope. So normally there are two pipelines. If we start from the fixed tissue, so the fixed samples are labeled with probes at first and then treated with gel anchoring chemicals like uh, acridite or, uh, or that uh, other uh, anchor stuffs, and then embedded in the swell of hydrogel and uh, homogenized and then expanded. Uh, in this, in this uh, protocol, the fluorescent signals would be decreased a lot during the digestion and the, and the expansion, and it has been described in many recent studies. So that's why there, there is another pipeline also has been uh, invented at the same time. So it's still, uh, the sample would still be fixed in the beginning and then uh, it will be gel anchored and, uh, and embedded. Uh, but, uh, but then uh, it will be expanded and then the, and the, then the immune staining labeling would be applied in the end. And the, in this kind of protocol, the fluorescent signal would be higher than the last one but we can only use those labeling tags, which would, would never be digested by the protease. So it also restricts the, the, the application. And the, then uh, Xiaoyu has invented label retention expansion microscopy. And the label retention expansion microscopy has successfully got rid of all those drawbacks with the design of new type of trifunction uh, anchors with three arms. So here there is the connector and the, which is an HS for the connection to the antibodies. And then also there is anchor, which is a method, uh, method acrylamide group for anchoring to the polymer matrix. And then there is a biotin or the decoxin, uh, decoxin genning and the, for the conjugation to, to an organic dye after expansion. So the experimental pipeline would be like after the primary antibody incubation and we add this trifunction inkers and then we uh, add the gel and then uh, embed the sample in the gel and then apply the digestions and then uh, after the after the expansion we we would still apply this strep targeting or anti dig staining to to bind with the biotin or the or the dig labels and then and then expand it and then we could see the, the effects is, is very clear and the, and the fluorescence is very strong. And he, uh, these are the antibodies used for staining. The, the magenta one is tubulin and then the green one is catheterin. So the resolution is, is pretty good and the, the scale indicated 200 nanometers. We could see the catheterin uh, coated uh, vesicles very clear here. And then uh, we compare, actually Xiaoyu has compared the, the uh, fluorescent intensity uh, results uh, of, the, of the labor retention expansion microscopy with the others. And the labor retention expansion microscopy would show much, much higher uh, brightness than, than, the, uh, than the previous two protocols. And, uh, and also uh, she has found that the, the main signal noise would happen during the uh, proteinase digestions, because because if we apply the labeling after the after the after digestion, it will be still higher than that. But 
but uh, labor retention expansion microscopy would offer the brightness at least the five or six times higher than, than the other two uh, methods. And also, we uh, I have noticed that here because uh, uh, by using the labor retention microscopy, we could even get the resolution very similar to the to the electro uh, micrograph. And uh, this is the this is also the clathrin coated uh, endocytotic vesicles. And we could see the scale is is very uh, is very small. Uh, and but for sure, this is the expanded effects before the expansion. We could see, actually, the the two uh, moleculars or the two proteins located on the the the, the pixels located on the on the ring would be smaller than 120 uh, nanometer, and actually, it cannot be distinguished under the uh, confocal or or light sheet because it's smaller than 200 nanometers. But after expansion, we could see that, and also this kind of structures has also been. Uh, observe the same under the electron uh, micrograph. So we we felt this way is the best way for observing all the endos uh, endocytotic vesicles. So I start applying it for uh, for my zebrafish experiments. And then uh, actually uh, here I I use it for for the for observing the endosomal transportation of the pass three and the delta D endosomes. So and why we why we are interested with this delta D uh, and the notch endosomes because uh, the notch delta in the cytotic signal is, would regulate the sulfate decision in the in the neurogenesis. It has because in the beginning we didn't pay much attention on that process because most of the people would uh, would uh, uh, would uh, just uh, thought all oh, those kind of notch delta like in the uh, combination and the signaling they are depending on this kind of lateral inhibition. So, like the like showing in the figure one, normally a differentiating cell uh, express express the DLL one, which is the notch ligand, and then the DLL one can activate notch signaling in the in the neighbor cell, and then the transmembrane notch is then processed in the uh, and then the the transmembrane protein notch would release the notch intracellular domain on SCD and then will transit to the nucleus and trigger the downstream transcription signals for keeping the proliferating activity as a, as a somatic stem cell. But recent studies in the Drosophila uh, sensory or organ precursors has found that uh, in the asymmetric cell division of these SOP cells, the delta node signaling, they can also go through the uh, endocytosis process and it will determine the sulfate Directly by this kind of asymmetric allocation of uh, of uh, delta node positive endosomes, and uh, normally the delta node uh, positive endosomes they would be inherited by the more proliferating P two A cells, and then P two B cells would would be differentiated into neurons. But how is it uh, in the in the vertebrate uh, neural stem cells is not fully understood. There are a lot of hypotheses, and uh, actually there are there are a lot of uh, uh, different results has been reported nowadays, so that's why we would like to use it. Well, it, we would like to use uh, live imaging together with the labor retention expansion microscopy to follow the process. So uh, at first, we have developed this kind of antibody uptaking assay. We have injected the uh, the anti uh, mouse uh, mouse anti. Uh, auto uh, 6047 labeled the delta D antibody into the hinderbrain ventricle of the zebrafish. And, the, and then that antibody uh, diffused into the forebrain and it will be uh, absorbed or uh, uptaken by the, by the radio glial cells in the forebrain area. And we could see all those kind of uh, cayenne dots, they are the internal nodes, the delta D endosomes. And then we applied the, the live imaging and we could see during the cell division if we if you could see the two green dots there, there are, these are the centrosomes. We could see the magenta dots, which are the delta D and endosomes. They are segregated uh, symmetrically uh, to the posterior uh, cells, and uh, it's very uh, it's very conserved, happening in the majority of the dividing radio glial cells. And uh, then we hypothesized that uh, uh, the 
that these delta d endosomes uh, they are relevant to the sulfate uh, determination because uh, there is the report that most of the posterior doctor cells they might be the self renewed doctor and then the anterior one might be the uh, differentiated one but for sure we need more uh, evidence so we continue with this pass three uh, live labeling and the, and the imaging because because we pass three is the uh, polarity protein play a key role in the symmetry cell division. And we already know that in the mouse radioglia cells, uh, the most uh, proliferating doctor cells would, in, uh, uh, would inherit the pass three from the mother cells and keep the, keep the stem cell uh, character. So the time-lapsing uh, time imaging also confirmed that. So, uh, sorry, I don't know how to... Yeah, I won't play it again. Uh, it's always covered, but we could see the the delta D dots always go together with the with the possibly GFP labeling during the process. So it clearly indicates the delta D endosomes go to the proliferating proliferating doctor cells in the end of the mitosis. And then we apply the uh, label retention expansion microscopy to show that cytosolic pass three always decorated with the delta D endosomes together with this DLIC1, the diving uh, light chain factor one. And, uh, and actually, if we don't apply the expansion, it will be like this. We can see a little bit colocalization, but we cannot see the, the structure of the endosomes uh, at, uh, at high resolution. But uh, after the expansion microscopy, label retention expansion microscopy with the uh, radioglia cell progenitors, we could see Actually, the endosome is very clear, and, uh, and we could see this kind of ring like uh, ring like structures of the endosome surrounded the delta D uh, antibody. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the first time we have shown that the, the PAS3 uh, uh, polarity proteins uh, would be transported together with the delta D endosomes in the, in the cytosolic part. And then we, we just uh, make, uh, make the make the, uh, how to say, we make the, the characterization of this process and the, and the, and also we have the determined that the delta notch intralineage uh, in the cytotic signaling uh, in the, in the asymmetry uh, division of uh, uh, zebrafish radio glia cells and the, all those kind of delta notch endosomes, they should be uh, transported along the microtubule and facilitated by the dining motor proteins to, to determine the uh, directional trafficking. And also the cortical uh, polarity proteins, uh, uh, pass three is incorporated with, the, with this endocytosis process. And uh, actually here, I, I would like to address why we uh, use the label retention microscopy together with the iodine a bit, uh, because, uh, during the process of the uh, LI EXM experiments, we found the most the challenge part is uh, is how to choose the good antibody for the experiments. Because with the good antibody, we could get very specific binding with the antigen all times, and we could get the signals amplified by the label retention expansion microscopy, uh, 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 label uh, this kind of uh, post expansion uh, staining step. But uh, actually, in most cases, we would use multiple antibodies, and uh, and uh, most antibodies they they would show a little bit uh, unspecific binding uh, at a uh, at a single case, or or sometimes uh, very very commonly some bad antibodies they would get a lot of backgrounds like this. So in the in the post expansion uh, staining step of the of the label retention expansion microscopy, we would get uh, some backgrounds. And this uh, is just like that. And uh, actually, then in the beginning, we thought uh, we, we may end up with that and we, we cannot uh, real handle with this kind of results. But then Armchen has introduced the iodine to me. Thank you so much, Young. And mm -hmm. thanks uh, everyone, Cindy, Rene, and everybody involved from BioProtocol site uh, for the opportunity to present our work. Uh, let me quickly share my screen and uh, are you able to see my screen?
Yes. I guess you can. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, yeah, I will take it over from here, and I will start with an image that my colleague uh, was showing earlier, and I will be talking uh, about uh, what we saw a little while ago, where we denoise the image and uh, get rid of these unspecific uh, bindings and expressions in the image. And how we do it is we did this with the package we developed uh, at uh, with, with my team at Chen Zuckerberg Biohub uh, and the package named Iden. So Iden is basically a self-supervised denoising package and it provides many different algorithms uh, within itself and it's a huge work and will not be possible uh, without help of a great team. So I'd like to thank my uh, previous coworker Hirofumi and Josh and uh, my current uh, colleague Loic uh, for their help and their contributions on the package. So uh, I like to start with a little screen recording video where I will do a little voiceover and show you how easy to use it is first, and then we will continue on the technical details. So here, uh, you are seeing the graphical user interface of the denoising package that we developed, which allows you to drag and drop your images or open your images with a dialogue. And if you have a multi-channel image, you're able to split the channels and focus and work on only on the channels that you're interested in. And with the help of dimensions tab, you can also make sure the software is interpreting the metadata uh, of the images that you have. And with the help of training crop, tab, you're able to choose uh, an interesting part of the, the data set that you have and train a stochastic model with a smaller data. And then in the end, denoise the entire data set, uh, which can save you a lot of time. And after choosing the desired algorithm, you basically just click start and it does its thing. So uh, we really wanted to make it accessible. So that's why we spent quite a long time to implement this graphical user interface. Uh, which can be uh, downloaded uh, with a standalone uh, executable for different operating systems that we build uh, with every version. And we like to think this is very easy to use. And we understand there are many use cases on our day-to-day -day work. Uh, sometimes we have a great amount of data and we have to do batch processing. And because of that, we also implemented a common line interface which will allow you to connect to your servers, to your HPC clusters, and uh, maybe you have like multi GPU nodes and, and you can run a big chunk of, uh, of data and process them in a faster manner. And we basically provided the entire functionality that we have in the graphical user interface in the common line interface as well. And also we know uh, we're well aware uh, there are many other programmers out there who are developing amazing uh, software that helps science and they might want to incorporate some denoising into their application. So this is why we also implemented a public API with a, a nice documentation, which you can find uh, with the link on the right uh, top corner, uh, item.app. And this is all good. This is how, the, you know, this is you know, basically different ways that you can use it, but I know you're here for the results. So let's start with uh, one data set from our collaborator uh, from France, uh, uh, from Jean Learn. Uh, this is the data that they published in 2019. And this is basically uh, a mouse embryo. Uh, I think it's a blastocyst uh, fracking that is imaged. And it has not a great amount of noise, but uh, since they want to have uh, better success in their downstream analysis, they, they wanted to try denoising. And the self-supervised denoising story is uh, pretty much uh, coming from a few years ago. And the, one of the uh, original papers is published, uh, is, is called Noise to Self. And that is basically using a convolutional neural network uh, that is called UNAT. And on a fair computer, a fairly strong computer, uh, basically it took 30 minutes for us uh, to run this. And since we wanted to make this tool accessible, uh, we were not very happy with this. So <laughs> we, we went ahead and we implemented more algorithms. And actually we were able to implement some of the more traditional algorithms with some tricks uh, where we were able to run it in one tenth of the time. And not only that, uh, but actually we use a much simpler method. So 
we realize that for different images, sometimes different algorithms works better. And we just said, you know what? Uh, there's, there's no silver bullet for all the images out there. And we also observe not only about the runtime, but in terms of the accuracy, uh, sometimes something simpler can work better. Uh, if you look at the points that I, I, I highlighted with the little red arrows, uh, you will see some hallucinations that is not existing uh, on the raw image or, uh, or on the result of the, 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 the second denoising. So sometimes using a fancy approach uh, can sound nice, but it can also bring a lot of hallucinations, which will not make uh, the biologists you're working with happy. So that's why we implemented many algorithms. And we started with the original paper implementation of the noise itself, which is implementing a unit. And we were well aware that this was uh, not easy to run on uh, computers that doesn't have a lot of uh, compute power. So we were looking for ways to run these uh, algorithms in a faster manner. So we went with the idea of engineering uh, some, some features and, and basically uh, training a series of regressors uh, to apply uh, noise to self. And we implemented uh, several different uh, regressors and we were able to uh, improve our runtime and accuracy on cer certain cases as well. This inspired us uh, to go back to convolutional neural network world and implement the same idea with some convolutional layers and a multi-layer perceptron. And we introduced a novel model called GINET, which is stand for J invariant network. And following this, we were still curious to see if we can uh, do more. And we were looking into the more classical traditional algorithms. And we realized that actually you need to fine tune their hyperparameters for your images one by one, and there's no recipe for it. So what we end up doing is we implemented an optimizer for the hyperparameters of these classical algorithms. And that brought us great success. And we implemented uh, pretty much many of them uh, in the literature. And we are still looking forward to add, uh, add more and uh, more algorithms uh, into, uh, into this, uh, into this uh, comprehensive list. So this is basically what we have about the algorithms. And since we talk on the results, I want to step back and continue with an important question that we asked ourselves. So me as a software engineer working with biologists, I, I now know very well that uh, for sure it's important to not have hallucinations in your uh, processed images, but also uh, while denoising images, we don't want to remove the information signal that is useful for the biological question. So how we can make sure when we denoise some images, we actually remove the noise, but not the information. And to investigate on this question, uh, I conducted an experiment. So at the first part of the experiment, I started with an image that I actually got from Xi'an. And I basically added more noise into it. And I calculated uh, Fourier ring correlations uh, between these two images, which is plotted on the right. And the x-axis is basically the frequencies going from zero to 250, whatever. And the y-axis is the correlations of the frequency components between these two images for a given frequency, uh, uh, frequency number. And this shows that actually most of the correlation is on the lower frequencies. And this also agrees with what we know from uh, optics and, and microscopy world, where with the limited resolution, we end up having a frequency cutoff that we, were, we are not able to uh, acquire any meaningful information after that certain cutoff. So on the second part of the experiment, I denoised the image and I calculated FRC curves between the pairs of these three images, which uh, helped me uh, to argue that actually the correlation between the denoised and the raw images increased greatly on the lower frequencies, as you can see on the figure on the right. And this is basically uh, completed with another FRC curve that I calculated, which is the FRC between the noisy image and the denoised result. 
because I am expecting to see somewhat similar thing because I know the noise is random and not localized and not uh, not localized in the lower frequencies. So uh, and with the with the green curve, uh, I I was also able to uh, confirm that. And going back, not only the images that Xiang uh, showed so far, but there's more to it. And thanks to this uh, nature of unspecific expressions on the label retention expansion microscopy, uh, we were able to get uh, many good results uh, with uh, a lot of data sets that he acquired. And another uh, good example that we have in our team, uh, we, we work on zebrafish a lot. And uh, there is this little project where we uh, do some confocal imaging on five somite stage and try to do like segmentation of the cells uh, with the nuclei marker, uh, the images acquired, and do some downstream analysis. And we were able to see we 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 improved the segmentation performance uh, when we first denoise our images and then run the segmentation pipeline uh, with my coworkers. So um, another example is uh, our collaboration uh, with the open cell team. Uh, again, with our coworkers at Biohub, where they uh, actually published a proteome-wide uh, database of images where uh, of, of, of human cells. And th this is a huge uh, database. And due to nature of different protein expressions, uh, some of them are very prone to noise. And with the help of Aiden, they were able to denoise and and interpret uh, their data better and help their downstream analysis. So I'm hoping that this tool can help many more other people out there. And here you can find uh, our source code the repository on with the link on the top, which is github.com slash Royal Lab slash Aiden. And our documentation is on, can be found at, can be found at Aiden.app. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, who helped our work and with Aiden and and with with label retention expansion microscopy with Xiang and and with this talk uh, and if you'd like to find out more about the tool feel free to head uh, to our documentation page and if you have any questions let us know I'm more than happy to uh, help each of you thanks a lot Thank you very much, I'm Chan and Xiang. And uh, uh, right before the seminar, actually, I, I tried to read IDIN with the help from Xiang and I'm Chan, and the results are amazing. So they are really cross modality. That's the one characteristic that I'm Chan didn't mention, but I feel like it's really appreciable for any denoising or uh, AI assistant. Uh, uh, imaging processing software. Um, now, uh, yeah, we have already answered a lot of questions from the uh, chat box, but if you have really long and uh, intense questions, feel free to unmute yourself if you can. Uh, but if you cannot, uh, just type the uh, uh, questions in, I'll read for you. Um, and there are quite a few questions that we didn't have time to answer yet. The first one, uh, that we didn't answer is in case of a fungal cells digestion of the cell wall, uh, of the cell wall changes cell morphology, which might affect uh, spatial localization of protein. This is one comment from uh, Arani. Uh, Sean, do you want to uh, answer the question or do you want me to answer the question? Uh, right, yeah, thanks. I have seen a lot of questions on the digestion step of the expansion microscopy and especially for this, for you, for applying this step with different type of cells. And uh, I have seen Andrea's question regarding the replace, uh, replacement of protein SK with cell wall digestion enzyme. And uh, he's working on the salmona using regular expansion microscopy combining cell wall digestion with subsequent protein SK digestion. So whether this uh, protein SK digestion is still required or not for the expansion because he has already applied the cell wall digestion. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I, I, I have never applied the, the cell wall digestion, but uh, I think that step is even more harsh than the protein SK, right? 
So, right. My, I think yeah, the, our, the thing. Yeah, you please. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I we think can, we can. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead, yeah, maybe. Yeah, I, I think maybe maybe after the cell wall digestion, then it will be quite uh, completed, and the protein SK digestion might be skipped. But uh, you can try. Yeah. I think to my experience, uh, different cell types or uh, model types will require uh, totally different digestion combinations. Uh, for example, here. Um, for the plant, the cell wall is uh, basically you digest the sugar and other things, which is not uh, only protein, but protein SK is targeting on the to uh, on the protein interaction. So I uh, I personally don't have experience with the uh, plant cell digestion, uh, but like uh, there are a lot of papers published like on plant cell expansion microscopy. Um, the basically for LR expansion microscopy, it has nothing special on the digestion step. So you can follow any di- digestion recommendations in the standard expansion microscopy for your target model system, no matter plant cell or bacteria or anything else. Um, so there's no conflict between um, our expansion microscopy protocol uh, with the standard one in terms of the digestion steps. Um, and also I think um, yeah, uh, about mislocal uh, localization if digestion is applied. Um, so that is a, a good question because uh, we definitely don't want to move the locations of uh, proteins from their or- original spatial uh, relationship with the uh, structure or the cell. So the thing, uh, uh, the short answer is no, you don't need to worry about it. Uh, the reason is that you apply digestion after gelation. So the first step um, in LR expansion microscopy is to modify the protein or install a anchor um, on the proteins uh, or RNA DNA uh, together and to anchor these cell molecules onto the hydrogel. So their play, uh, their original position is already locked in the hydrogel in the hydrogel scaffolding and the digestion step uh, comes after the gelation step. So everything is fixed in place already. The digestion only breaks down the interactions between the neighboring proteins or uh, other molecules which are anchored. Um, So the digestion step is only to make sure your expansion is uh, homogeneous and isotropic. Um, So I hope I answered that question. Right, Amchen, there is a question about uh, iodine on the program, uh, programmation studies. Maybe you can answer that. The question from Catherine. Uh, yes, uh, I think uh, I'm not sure what is meant by programmation studies. So if Catherine can follow up on that, I like to give an answer uh, in, in a great, greater detail. All right, actually the label retention expansion microscopy protocol is, is published on, bio, uh, on the bio protocol journal. Yeah, you can find it. It's just the list uh, below our, our webinar uh, page, so yeah. Yeah, I think I can get back to, to Catherine's question and uh, no no programming needed uh, to, to develop and understand the technique uh, as soon as, uh, the label retention expansion uh, part of the protocol uh, is applied as is. Uh, you can use uh, item, it's ready to use out of the box uh, and you can download it. Uh, you can download the executable or if you are a Python user, you can get it from Python package index uh, with the pip install item. And if you have any trouble installing it uh, with either of these methods, uh, feel free to reach out, uh, happy to help. And I think I also got a private uh, direct message question from the uh, website before webinar. What are some of your preferred markers to estimate the degree of expansion? This is 
very uh, good question. Um, because we always worry um, if the expansion will change the dimension uh, made like locally, right? Because uh, from the macro size, you can measure the gel size after expansion versus before expansion and uh, calculate the expansion factor overall. But there is a chance that in some local area, if your digestion is not complete enough, meaning that your proteins are still hinging each other um, and you cannot achieve full uh, isotropic uh, expansion locally, that is a bigger problem that we worry. So to prevent this problem, the first thing is that uh, that's also one uh, motivation we develop uh, label retention expansion microscopy because uh, before our method, um, we always have to check, uh, do a balance between the um, between the digestion and the anchoring. If we anchor, if we digest too much, then we lose a lot of uh, probes. Uh, if we digest too little, then problem happens in in uh, in is isotropic expansion, like local um, like uh, expansion factor uh, that is smaller than the overall, right? So for LR expansion, the different thing is your label is directly COVID only cross-linked to the hydrogel, it does not uh, rely on the, uh, the uh, re uh, remaining proteins to stay in your hydrogel. So you can do a thorough uh, digestion to make sure the protein interaction is totally break down and you still have the signal uh, which marks their original position. This is one way we can prevent the local distortion during expansion. Uh, but also we need a readout to <laughs> prove the concept, right? So uh, there I give the answer to the question, what are some of your preferred markers to estimate the degree of expansion? Um, and the, uh, the short answer is there is no perfect uh, system intrinsic ruler to, uh, to measure the local expansion microscopy, but there are some uh, like uh, benchmark or hallmark uh, comp protein complexes like nuclear pore complexes. They are very small and very hard to expand because they are uh, basically uh, very condensed, com compact, formed by uh, many different nuclear pore rings in the scaffold. If you can digest them well and have them uh, expand it well, then you probably can expand uh, other organelles in the system isotropically. So nuclear pore is one, uh, one ruler uh, one ruler for you because you know the original uh, size of nuclear pore. That's a fixed number, right? Um, and uh, also another thing people use as a benchmark for the expansion distortion is the uh, centriole. They're also very tight, very compact uh, uh, protein complexes. If you can expand them uh, and have the local expansion factor agreeing with your overall gel expansion factor, then pretty much you guarantee your other organelles in the cells are expanded isotopically. Um, so uh, my answer is nuclear pore complexes and centrioles are the two uh, markers we can use to evaluate the isotropic expansion. I think I answered the last question. Uh, when using expansion microscopy to all of the organelles extend to the same ratio or is the expansion more or only some of the organelles? Uh, the answer is uh, basically I'm repeating or summarizing my previous answer. Uh, that is um, when your digestion is thorough, the expansion factor should be the same for any organelle. But if it's not thorough, um, it's probably limited by uh, the protocol you're using or uh, the degree of digestion. You just cannot, you, 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 if you do a thorough digestion, um, you, may, you worry you lose the um, signal, then um, for those cases, the expansion factor for very dense organelles, uh, for example, polymer-based organelles may be different from the overall. Sean, do you want to answer? So, yeah, I, I'm reading the question from uh, from Kim. Uh, actually, I'm I'm wondering what kind of encapsulated uh, proteins. Yeah, 
but uh, but uh, the the first thing uh, you need to be make sure is that uh, your antibody or attacks can real uh, bind with your antigen in the in the first uh, step. I mean the the step of antibody incubation even before applying the trifunction linkers. Uh, but uh, also for sure, if the if the labeling uh, uh, efficiency or the labeling uh, specificity is is rather low, is fine. If your antibody is very specific to the protein encapsulated in uh, uh, by the other proteins, for, for sure, uh, I think you will still get uh, some labeling, and uh, then by applying the protein SK digestions and the expansion, and also the signal amplification by the by the biotin or DIG labeling, you should see something there, yeah. And it's great. It would be much easier if you can also label the the protein outside of your encapsulated uh, proteins, then you would see the difference, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the that's the best. Just uh, like what I have done. I have labeled the, the endosoma delta D by this kind of live labeling. Actually, if I apply the fixed labeling, it may be more difficult. So actually I labeled the protein before it gets encapsulated. So, and then let the dynamic steps to, to get it to uh, endocytotic, uh, cap, uh, uh, how to say, package it. And, and then I also use the antibody to label the, the endosome uh, ring um, by, by using that the dining light chain factors or the pass three factors. Actually, we also use the uh, recycling endosome markers to label the outlayers uh, in, in the following studies. Yeah. So I hope I hope I have answered the question. Yeah. Uh, I show you there is an interesting like question. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, you utilize antibody fragments like single chain uh, antibodies or nanobodies for labeling and would that improve tissue accessibility? Uh, yes, of course, we can, uh, we can use nanobodies and uh, single chain antibodies like that for sure. So basically what we do is just to uh, conjugate the tri-functional linkers, the LR expansion tri-functional linkers onto the onto uh, the antibody or nanobody. Um, I think it really depends on how many lysines are, because right now we are using NHS ester versus primary amine reaction to conjugate. So for nanobodies, you probably only will have one um, trifunctional linker on the nanobody and for, um, for antibody, for whole antibodies, you have uh, around 10 or so. So you will basically end up with different uh, level of signal amplification. But of course you can use nanobodies. And actually I think we really want to push forward to that uh, direction because when you are reaching molecular resolution, for example, combining LR expansion with other super resolution optical microscopes, you are entering the range of, for example, 20 nanometers or even five nanometers by combining with storm, then you really need to worry about the size of your label, right? So the nanobody definitely uh, helps. And here you talk, uh, you talk more about uh, accessibility and that definitely helps uh, just like any uh, uh, normal labeling, right? So expansion microscopy cannot help uh, well, expansion microscopy cannot help with your labeling efficiency. That's something you optimized uh, before you apply uh, expansion microscopy. But there are other uh, types of expansion microscopy, for example, MAP or UXM um, or uh, cubic uh, shields. They actually uh, do the agilization and digest uh, and denaturation, not really, not protein SK digestion, but heat denaturation. Uh, before they apply antibodies for immunostaining. So in those cases, um, there are pros and cons. So there are chances that they further open up after expansion, they open up uh, the, uh, the, the protein and make or the structure and make your antibodies more accessible to the antigen. And the con is the during uh, gelation and the heat denature, uh, they also damage some of the epitopes. So some of the antibodies will not work anymore. Um, so that's my answer to the accessibility um, question. 
can you use a snap or halo tag for labeling? Yes, we're using snap. Uh, well, uh, I think Xiang is not using snap uh, because Xiang's model system is a zebra fish. It's harder to genetically modify uh, or at this point he didn't have the needs. But for our lab, we constantly use uh, snap tag, clip tag, uh, in the cells to uh, to do the label retention expansion microscopy. If you go for my original uh, paper uh, on JC, uh, in JCB uh, named the label retention expansion microscopy, you will see uh, we designed a specific uh, side functional linkers for snap tag and clip tag. All right, yeah, I just would like to, to add a little bit here. And uh, actually, we're also using Halotech transgenic fish now, and uh, we also use, uh, use the LR exam for, for labeling those Halotech ex expression cells. So, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Sorry, I forgot to, you're at Biohub. You guys can <laughs> knock in anything in any model system. <laughs> right. Yeah, actually, uh, there I I found there is an open question in the QA session, and uh, the question is from Atom Mio, and uh, actually he he or she is asking whether it's possible to resolve and find cell to cell contacts with unspecific protein staining, because he 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 or she is interested in cell contacts between two tissue layers in the whole insect embryos. Yeah, that's interesting. I I never tried. It use unspecific protein stain. Do you know what's that? Uh, yeah, I, I tried. So basically mm. nowadays we're pushing forward the expansion microscopy into the SEM field. So we label expand, uh, we label proteins in non-specific way with NHS ester dye or other um uh, or other um dye that could modify protein, RNA, DNA, lipids, sugar, whatever, uh, with a functional uh, group uh, in addition to the dye. So you can definitely think uh, the, uh, the expansion microscopy as an alternative approach for scanning electron microscopy. So of course you can do cell cell contacts uh, structure evaluation. And how thick uh, there is a question about the thickness of the cryo sections. I remember. All uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. I answered. Actually. Yeah. I, I can. I can answer here again. Actually, I have used the cryo sections at around the uh, twenty micron at most. But also for sure, the thinner would be better because the digestion would be more complicated and uh, and the tissue would be more transparent. Yeah. Uh, in our lab, we have tried up to a hundred. Uh, like micron, uh, th uh, like thickness, but after expansion, they are very like they they they're gonna be four hundred micron thick. The most of your uh microscopes will not uh reach to that working distance. So we switched to two photon to image those uh thick expanded samples. But um, you should have no problem to extend the two very thick uh sections, but. Of course, every staining step will take longer time um, to reach uh, ideal uh, labeling efficiency. I think that's why Xiang said the, the thinner the section is, uh, the, the better the labeling uh, or all the chemical modification would be. So that's a practical concern. But if you really, really want need the 3D architecture of your tissue um, or you have very long neurons that you want to image through, you can definitely go for uh, thicker samples, but you probably need another microscope, a different microscope to image. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have seen there is one more question in the QA session about the, how to prove that the cell is expanded the same way in 3D. And uh, actually, I think uh, from the first paper published by Bonis group, they have already tried to use the ground truth or something like that to prove it's uh, the gel expansion is uh, uh, is uh, evenly in uh, in each direction, and uh, they also emphasize the hydration step. Hydration step would be very important because we need to make sure the gel is expanded thoroughly before applying the the final step for the for the imaging or for the post expansion staining, right? But uh, I I think Xiaoyu may have more 
opinions uh, 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 or more suggestions how, um, on how to prove that. The ideal way is to have a readout that is to embed a uh, ready uh, DNA or agave into the system because uh, with the known structure, known dimension, you'll uh, and compare that with your imaging, you'll know the expansion factor. However, it's like our lab also tr uh, tried and other labs uh, also tried uh, the DNA origami. It's challenging to really anchor DNA origami onto the hydrogel and so we are not very motivated to push towards uh, that direction. Um, and so people instead use uh, a bio biological system to um, that they know the direction in all 3D direction X, Y, Z to characterize um, the, um, the gel expansion. So what I can say is if your gel is small and with the uh, similar monomer um, formula, so that means they are not too squishy. Uh, you, you, you don't need to worry about the, um, the X, Y, Z, uh, or the Z. Basically, people worry more about Z because Z direction is experiencing the gravity um, and it's water-based, right? Um, so if your gel is not huge and has the same percentage of acrylamide as our, uh, uh, as our formula, you don't need to worry too much. But if you see it and you feel your biological system looks flatter, then that's a red flag. So we need to, um, the, the data will be the final call. There is a question about uh, how do you prevent your gels from moving on the cover slope in XY during image acquisition? Sure. Yeah, actually, yeah, I can I can try to answer this question. It's very technical, and it seems uh, Marisa has already applied some imaging with the expansion uh, microscopic samples. Actually, I'm using the six well glass bottom dishes. So actually, I normally would put the gel uh, very close to the wall on one side and try to remove the water between the gel and the, and the glass as much as possible, so to make it. Uh, little bit dried up to get rid of any gaps between the gel and the and the glass bottom and then the gel would attach it to the well at the same time so during the imaging it won't uh, be that removable so yeah i'm not uh, i'm not using a very a small well i mean that uh, i just use six well petri dish so <laughs> yeah. it's also suggested by xiao yu so <laughs> I think Xiang is overall a very careful researcher. And mm. uh, when he operates on microscope, he's very gentle, but my students don't. So we, we have to use additional uh, ways to, to keep the, the gel uh, stay on the cover slope as a rock. So what we do is we coat uh, the glass surface, the cover slope surface with poly L lysine. So as you know, poly L lysine has a positive charge. And for the gel, the acrylamide gel, the surface has negative charge. So as soon as you land your gel onto the uh, poly L lysine coated uh, cover slope ready for imaging, the gel will uh, adhere there as rock. Even if you shake, they won't move. And so we monitored the stability or the drifting of the gel on those uh, poly L lysine coated surface for a day or so. Um, so I can, well, uh, in our lab, um, we have a stable optical um, table. So what we see is it moves less than 10 microns per hour. So that's really, really minimal. If you apply the poly out icing coating um, on your uh, cover glass, you, even if you have careless students, you should have no problem. You should see no um, drifting during your hourly imaging. <laughs> Yeah, great. I hope uh, we have answered all the questions. Yeah. Great. Okay. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, I think we're going to finish here. First of all, thank you so, so much for this amazing talk, for the amazing talks, Jiang and Ahmed, and also for this super lively um, Q&A section. I, um, we had plenty of time, and I think 
people really got their specific questions answered. So I hope this was helpful for everyone. So thank you all for that. Um, if there are any more questions, please visit um, please visit our website. And we have a Q&A section there. You can still post questions. You can also see questions um, that have been posted and answered. Several questions have already been answered. Maybe some of these questions will already answer your question. So please take a look. But if you have any more questions, you can still post questions and we will still invite experts, our speakers, but also other experts to answer those questions. Um, the, as I said, early on this webinar was recorded. So we will, or is still being recorded, and we will post it later on the website. Usually it takes about one to two weeks until it's up on the website. And then I want to announce our um, last webinar of the year. Um, on December 6th, we will have a speaker from Norway, Helga Lensberg, will talk about chromatin binding of RNA polymerase II and its phosphorylated forms through the cell cycle by flow cytometry. If you want to know more about this webinar, please also visit our website. And as always, you will see um, additional um, webinars for the next year there soon as well. Thank you again for joining us today, and we hope to see you next time. Okay, bye-bye.